The theme for the conference is uh, the business of agriculture producing for profit. And you heard this morning that over the long term, returns in our agriculture have been comparable with many other investments. But we know that in achieving this, agriculture has changed a lot. There are many fewer farms than there once were, and the average farm is now much larger than it was several decades ago. This afternoon, I want to look at that structural change and what it tells us about what to expect in the future. But first, I'll give a bit more detail on farm financial performance over the last few years. Incomes for broadacre farms have been relatively high in recent years. Nationally, farm cash incomes projected to have declined in 2014-15 to average $114,000 a farm. Now, that's still around about 20% above the 10-year average. For the dairy industry, performance has varied substantially and is projected to decline to $97,000 a farm, around 14% below the 10-year average. Despite increased milk production, dairy incomes are projected to be lower in most states except Queensland and Western Australia as a result of lower farm gate milk prices and higher expenditure on fodder and feed grains. Broadacre performance has varied within and across states. Overall, incomes for New South Wales farms are projected to decline slightly. Higher livestock prices and increased production of grain in central and southern regions offset further reductions in grain production in northern New South Wales as a result of prolonged drought. In Victoria, incomes are projected to decline because of reduced grain production to be around 13 per cent below the 10-year average. And in Queensland, drought continued to affect broadacre farms, subduing winter crop and livestock production and maintaining high turnoff of beef cattle. Higher cattle prices are projected to result in a small rise in Queensland farm cash incomes, but they'll still be around 10 per cent below the 10-year average. Western Australian and South Australian incomes are expected to decline, but they're still around 30 per cent above the 10-year average. And in Tasmania, incomes are expected to increase to well above the 10-year average to $104,000 a farm, largely as a result of higher beef cattle, lamb, wool and crop receipts. I want to spend one or two minutes outlining the situation around farm debt. Farm business debts estimated to have declined slightly for broadacre farms since 2009-10 as, as a result of a reduction in new borrowing and continued debt repayment. Last year averaged $512,000 a farm. Debt for farm businesses affected by drought increased by an average of 5%, but declined by around 1% for all other farms. And for the dairy industry, debt increased by around 4% during 2013-14 to average almost $784,000 a farm. In this slide, the bars show the proportion of broadacre farms with relatively high debt servicing commitments. So an interest to receipts ratio of greater than 15%. You can see that at the national level, it's fallen steadily since that peak of 29% in 2006-07 to around about 12% now. Now that's been achieved through the relatively small reduction in debt I showed in the last slide, combined with improved farm receipts and lower interest rates. In some regions, debt servicing is still difficult for many farms especially in Queensland and northern New South Wales, where seasonal conditions have been poor for an extended period. While at a national level, debt didn't change last year, debt did increase on 27% of broadacre and dairy farms. Importantly, much of the increase has been used to fund expansion and increase intensity, both of which would be expected to have productivity and profitability payoffs in the long term. Land purchase accounted for 37% of the increase in principal owed by broadacre and dairy farms. And 29% was used to fund the purchase of farm machinery and vehicles. 26% was to fund shortfalls in cash flow, so to cover business losses. I want to look at trends in the size of Australian farms and the key factors underpinning the increase in farm size, 
before noting some industry level implications. You can see that the, the average size of broadacre farms has been increasing, whether we look at area operated or receipts generated. In addition to increasing area operated, intensification and switching to higher valued outputs have been significant sources of growth in whole farm receipts, especially from the mid-1990s when the increase in receipts has been substantially greater than the increase in area operated. The trend towards larger economic size of farms primarily reflects the strong positive relationship between farm size and profitability. In the broadacre sector, this relationship is highly consistent with profitability increasing across the range of farm sizes. It holds for individual sectors as well. While examples of highly profitable and unprofitable farms can be found among any group of similar sized farms, those earning higher rates of return tend to be larger than the less profitable ones. One reason for this general relationship is that for a number of reasons, larger farms tend to make more use of leading technologies. An implication for smaller farms seeking to improve profitability is that expanding their operations alone is not necessarily the answer. It's also important to access the leading technologies. While outright purchase of new equipment may not be an option for many smaller farms, there are other ways to access new technologies, using contractors, leasing advanced machinery and equipment, or entering into cooperative arrangements. Increasing farm size underpins two significant industry level changes. Most obviously, more outputs being produced by fewer farms, but also agriculture's increasingly dominated by farms at both ends of the size spectrum. This figure shows the proportions of, far of the farm population and total industry output against farm size category ordered from smallest to largest. The largest 10% of businesses, those with receipts greater than a million dollars, account for 49% of total broadacre output. In contrast, the smallest 52% of farms, those with receipts less than $200,000, account for only 15% of total output. The large number of farms producing relatively little output and hence generating relatively little income reflects the importance of off-farm income in sustaining many farm households. Our farm survey data show the smallest 52% of farms derive on average 88% of their disposable household income from off-farm sources. In contrast, the largest 10% earn only 17% of their disposable income off-farm. Some recent research from the United States shows similar trends apply there as well. Here you can see the trend towards increasing output concentration over time. The share of output produced by large farms, receipts greater than a million dollars, the blue area, has increased substantially from 16% in the 1970s to 50% now. Conversely, the share of output produced by medium sized farms, the orange area, has declined from 67 to 38%. And there are significant differences between industries in the extent to which these structural adjustments happened. For example, small farms in the cropping industry now account for a much smaller proportion of total farms and output than do their counterparts in the beef industry. Beef farms in the smaller size category account for around three quarters of the total farm population and around one quarter of industry output. While the smallest cropping farms account for about one quarter of farms, and less than 3% of total output. The relatively high proportion of total farms and output attributable to small beef farms substantially reduced the industry level measures of profitability and productivity. And here we can see the, the effect of size on profitability, where industry level profitability, profitability is estimated with and without that smallest group of farms. When we exclude the smallest group, the average annual rate of return increases nearly tenfold, from 0.3% for all farms to 2.9%. In contrast, the average rate of return in the cropping industry increases by less than twofold, because the smallest farms account for a much lower proportion of inputs and outputs. As you can imagine, 
The same thing happens with the productivity estimates. When it comes to beef, and probably sheep as well, comparatively low profitability and productivity of the smallest farms primarily reflects the fact they produce small quantities of output given their input use. The two major inputs that are potentially overused on the smallest beef farms are labour and land. Labour productivity on large beef enterprises has increased significantly, with the most efficient producers now managing around 20,000 dry sheep equivalents per labour unit. Obviously, it's difficult for a small beef property to achieve this. With respect to land, the smallest properties are often located in high rainfall regions or close to population centres and have relatively high land values. Unless stocking and turnoff rates are also high, this means that profitability, measured as the rate of return on total capital, will typically be low. Now, as I mentioned before, one consequence of industry consolidation is a broad acre industry increasingly dominated by farms at either end of the size spectrum. At one end, a relatively small number of large farms now account for the majority of output. At the other end, a consequence of the trend towards larger farms is that in absolute numbers, the majority of farm businesses in Australia are now small rather than medium sized. You can see here that the number and share of medium sized farms has declined significantly, the orange area. In the late 1970s, there were approximately 49,000 medium sized farms in the broadacre sector, accounting for around about 50% of the population. The 18,000 that remain now represent 35% of the population. Now this change was driven mainly by larger farms acquiring medium farms rather than farms growing out of the medium sized category. In addition, you can see that although the number of small farms has fallen, the reduction has been much smaller than the decline in medium farms. And this reflects several factors. Small farms account for a relatively small amount of agricultural land, so they represent a limited opportunity for large farms to expand. Owners of small farms typically derive a substantial share of their income from off-farm sources and may be under relatively little pressure to adjust. And small farms are attractive for recreational or lifestyle uses. They're often close to urban centres and typically have substantial fixed improvements, increasing their value but making them less attractive to those looking to expand. So to quickly conclude, although as this figure shows, the total number of farms is declining, this doesn't mean the future is bleak, far from it. While returns in agriculture will always be variable, the industry has shown it generates competitive returns and there's evidence of significant investment in land and capital to improve on-farm productivity over the longer term. Furthermore, structural adjustment has been substantial and has played an important role in generating the productivity growth required to offset a declining terms of trade. We can expect this to continue, and it needs to, if we're to maintain competitiveness. Adjustments most likely to occur among medium and large size farms, with less change likely among smaller farms. While larger farms are more profitable on average, there's no guarantee that becoming larger will lead to higher profits. Having access to the latest technologies is also important. And more and more, we'll need to think about the demographics of the farm sector when making decisions as industry averages become less representative. There are implications of this for those interested in increasing the profitability and the productivity of the sector. In particular, to the extent that small and large farms have different objectives, a range of approaches is going to be required. Thank you.